Hello. Today, I'll be talking about one of the most crucial uh, aspects of the Buddha's teaching. And this is the um, quality of the Buddha's teaching that is um, one of cause and effect. That the teachings of the Buddha has the quality of being true to the nature of how things arise and how things cease. That everything that arises comes from a cause. And the teachings of the Buddha are able to describe the actual cause that uh, gives rise to the state of affairs that we find ourselves in. And also the uh, effects that come from the the, the um, way that we respond and interact with the world around us. So our ability to understand why it is that we are the way we are and what uh, consequences will come from our actions and from our state of mind. This is the Buddha's teaching on dependent origination or paticca samuppada, which says that all of our happiness and suffering, all of the difficulties and, and uh, uh, upset, stress and, and dissatisfaction that we meet with in the world, as well as all of the peace and happiness and uh, well-being that comes, has a cause. And <coughs> the teaching of the Buddha is able to describe this cause. The teaching of dependent origination is the perfect um, method for us to understand and to thereby adjust and overcome the causes of suffering and thereby overcome all of suffering, uh, any type of, of suffering and stress that might come in the future. The, the teaching of dependent origination of the Buddha is, <coughs> is best seen as a practical teaching. Often when people approach the teachings of the Buddha, they will, as I've said before, look at it from an intellectual point of view, trying to understand it logically, to think of examples by which they can, um, by which they can, they can understand and, and accept and agree with the, the, the teachings as they're presented, ways of explaining and, and ways of assimilating it with their own view and their own understanding of reality. But this is not really the um, most useful, uh, beneficial, and, and proper way to approach the Buddhist teaching, most especially the Buddhist teaching on cause and effect, because this teaching is something that <coughs> can be seen, can be understood based on our experience of reality, most especially our experience in the meditation practice. So when we undertake to practice meditation or in our daily lives, when we encounter difficulties and problems, when we encounter situations that give rise to wantings and desires or aversions and, and, and dislikes uh, that give rise to our uh, conceit and, uh, and attachment and delusions, jealousy and, and uh, envy and so on, um, that we, we are able to see this process in action. We should be able to see the nature of, 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 of reality in terms of cause and effect, that when this arises, that will follow. When this doesn't arise, if, if you're able to somehow um, give up the cause, give up the behavior that is causing the problem, then the problem has no possible way of arising. So it says that reality is, really functions both physically and mentally on a scientific basis, that, there, that nothing arises by chance or by <coughs> uh, magic or by uh, some su any supernatural means, that there is no possible way for any um, phenomenon to arise without its cause, without the appropriate cause. And so in this way, once we understand the causes, we understand, we understand the, nat the relationship between phenomena um, between suffering and, and uh, unwholesome states and between happiness and wholesome states, 
between those states that lead to suffering and the suffering and between those states that lead to happiness and the happiness, then uh, our mind will naturally incline towards the development of those deeds and those mind states that lead to happiness because there's no one in the world that wants to suffer. The problem is not that we want to to hurt ourselves. Uh, in, intrinsically, all beings are always looking for that which is pleasant or that which is peaceful, that which is true uh, happiness. The problem is that we don't understand the, the nature of cause and effect. We do certain things and we, ha we uh, create certain mind states thinking that this is going to somehow lead to our benefit, when in fact those things that we create, those states of mind and those actions, are only for our detriment, are a cause for our suffering. And so in, in simply by not understanding, by this ignorance and delusion, we create, uh, we create states that are contradictory to our, our purpose, where we, we, we want to be happy and we're actually causing ourselves suffering. And this is how the Buddha's teaching on dependent origination starts. The first part of the teaching is that ignorance creates formations. It is due to ignorance that our mind um, gives rise to its mental formations or gives rise to concepts. It conceives things. It, it gives rise to ideas and, and all sorts of, of intentions and volitions and the very root of karma of all of our ethical action both um, ethical and unethical, simply due to our ignorance. If we understood that these formations, these conceptions, these intentions were going to cause us suffering, we wouldn't give rise to them. If we didn't have our, our ignorance, if, if, if we understood that there was no way to find happiness in this way, that even creating um, you know, stable lifestyles where we have a, a, a nice car and a house and a job and all these things, if we understood that this would, wasn't able to bring us happiness, even these good things, then we wouldn't strive for them. The intention wouldn't arise to find these things, to cling, to attach even to people or to places or to things. If we understood reality, we wouldn't cling to these things. We wouldn't even give rise to those ethical acts that were for the benefit of giving, of creating pleasant circumstances where we had, you know, good friends and, and good food and, and uh, um, a good society and so on. We wouldn't even think to give rise to, uh, to those intentions. We would be content and at peace with ourselves. We would have no need for anything. We wouldn't strive if we understood that striving, this um, giving rise to um, um, intention, or the desire to create, the desire to destroy, the desire to change, to force, to build up some concept of, of me, of I, of, uh, of identity in the world. If we understood that this was suffering, we wouldn't give rise to it. So, the Buddha, the, this, this is an incredibly powerful teaching because normally we would think that, that without this intention, nothing happens. Without this intention, no good can come, fr come from your life. But really the, the, the ultimate truth of reality is that it, it is what it is. It arises and it ceases. Reality comes and goes. And there is no one thing in the world that can truly make you happy and at peace. There's nothing that you can create that won't be destroyed. There's nothing that you can build up that won't fall apart. There's nothing that can truly make you happy or satisfy you. If you can't find happiness and peace uh, as you are, as things are in all of reality, then you'll inevitably fall into suffering and disappointment when things change and inevitably go against your wishes. So, in, once we give rise to understanding, uh, if, if we understand reality, the point is that we will never have any wishes or any hopes or any desires because we're truly happy. We will never want for anything. We will never um, hope for anything or wish for anything because we're content the way things are. We're happy with reality as it is. And this is really the key, not to create anything that is inevitably going to fall apart or disappear, but to be content with whatever comes, whatever should arise. So this is the key principle in Buddhism, that understanding sets you free. It's not 
attaining anything, it's not vowing for anything, it's not creating anything, simply understanding things as they are will set you free. And this is why uh, insight meditation or meditation where one contemplates reality is so crucial. Simply by watching reality, you change your whole way of looking at it, you change your whole way of being, and you change your whole universe so that nothing can bring you suffering. This is the key. Many people begin to practice meditation thinking that they're going to attain or create or, or um, perceive or experience something special that is not going to fall apart, that is not going to disappear, that is somehow going to make them uh, satisfied. And as a result, they're, they're, they're dissatisfied with the meditation when they realize that there's nothing that is going to satisfy them. And this is an important point for us to understand that the meditation is not for building up, it's for letting go, for giving up, and for uh, accepting and being at peace and at harmony with things as they are, just simply understanding. So when we practice meditation, say watching the, the breath, the stomach when it rises and falls, or watching our feet move when we walk, or watching any part of reality, simply being aware that we're standing or sitting, uh, being aware of pains and aches in the body, as I've said before, when you feel pain, say pain, pain, simply seeing it for what it is. Uh, y you, you accomplish the goal of, of the Buddha's teaching. You don't have to create anything, you don't have to change anything, you don't have to get rid of the pains and the aches, you don't have to get rid of the thoughts and the mind, but simply saying to yourself, it is what it is, this is pain, this is thought, this is uh, emotion, this is movements of the body when we're walking, saying walking, walking, or, or so on. Simply reminding yourself and creating this clear awareness of the phenomenon as it is, uh, is what uh, it frees us from suffering. So this is the the, the core of the Buddha's teaching on dependent origination, that ignorance leads to formations. It's actually a good summary of the whole of the, the dependent origination, because that's really how it works. We, our ignorance gives rise to formation, and those formations in turn, we, we're ignorant about them, thinking that somehow they're going to satisfy us, and so we give rise to more and more of these formations again and again. But the next part of the, of the, the cycle goes into great detail about how this works because those formations are what give rise to our, our lives. They give rise to our birth, our becoming. It's based on this that when we, when we pass away from one life, we create a new life. We cling and we, we develop this existence that we see in front of us, that we have, where we have a brain and we have a body and where we have a, a world around us. We create this again and again and again. And this gives rise to consciousness. So the Buddha said, these formations give rise to our, our conscious awareness in this life. And this is the next, the next link. So when we're first born, there arises a consciousness, say, in the womb of, of, of our mother. And from that moment on, uh, we, we will see the cause and effect arising. Now, uh, this is, the, this is the, the, the detailed exposition. So the first part is just talking about life after life after life, where ignorance give ri gives rise to our intentions to do this or that. Now, when you get into a single life, then we start with the first uh, moment that has been created, this, this consciousness. And through our whole life, it's going to be this consciousness that is most important. So in the Buddha's teaching, the mind is the, the, the most important aspect. And, and uh, I think you can, uh, it's easy to understand based on talking about how our misunderstandings uh, are what creates suffering. So when we understand how ignorance creates our, our intentions, we can understand how important the mind is. So this is the beginning. How does it work? The mind, the consciousness, gives rise to our experience of reality. We experience the physical and we experience the mental. So it gives rise to this psychophysical psycho, psycho or mental, mental physical reality. For instance, the experience of the stomach when, we, when we're breathing, when the stomach rises and the stomach falls, there's the physical and the mental. The rising is the physical and the knowing of the rising is the mental. When we walk, there's the foot moving is the physical, the mind knowing it is the mental. When we feel pain, there's the physical experience and there's the mind that, that knows it. 
uh, and doesn't like it and so on and, and says that's painful and so on. Um, the, the whole of our lives thus circle around in these, with these two um, realities, the mind and the experience uh, of, the, of, of the, the objects around us. Now, this in and of itself isn't really a problem. Obviously, we have to experience, we have to live our lives, and there's no suffering that comes from this. The suffering doesn't come from the things that we experience. The suffering, as I said, comes from our misunderstanding. Once we have the, the phys psychophysical uh, matrix, the, the, the physical and the, and the mental aspects of reality, the experiences of, of, uh, of the body and the mind, then we get the six senses. So the next link is once you have the physical and the mental, then you're going to have sensations. You're going to have the seeing, the hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. So this is where the physical and the mental arise. They arise at the eye. The, uh, the eye itself is physical. The light touching the eye is physical. The mind that knows the, the, um, the seeing is mental. Hearing, the sound, and the ear are, are physical, and the, so and the knowing of the sound or the, the hearing is mental, and so on. So the six senses are our experience of reality. So here we have three. We have the consciousness, which is aware of the physical and the mental, uh, realities at the six senses. So the, knowing the mental is in this case knowing the mind. So the, the mind is aware of the thoughts. It's aware of the, the, the aspects of the mind or the, the formations that arise in the mind. And once you have the six senses, then you have contact. Now, these four together uh, make up the neutral aspects um, sorry, the, these four along with the next one, which is, um, which is fe feeling or sensation. So when, once you have consciousness, then you will have uh, the, the mental and physical experience at the six senses uh, because of the contact, the contact between the mind and the physical. When the mind goes out to the body, when the mind goes out to the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, or when the mind goes out to the, to the thoughts, then there is contact. Once there is contact, then there arises sensation. There arises a pleasant sensation, an unpleasant sensation, or a neutral sensation. These five aspects of reality are the neutral aspect of reality. The, the, our whole life would be fine if this is all we had. Uh, and, and thus, these five are the most important uh, aspects of reality for us to to um, to examine and to analyze. Once we come to understand these clearly, to see them for what they are, and to not go the next step, which is going to get us into trouble, simply knowing when we feel pain, knowing when we feel happy, knowing when we see, knowing when we hear. When we see something, we know it as seeing. So we say to ourselves, seeing, seeing. When we hear something, we know it as hearing. We say to ourselves, hearing, hearing. When we feel pain, we know it as pain. We say to ourselves, pain, pain. Just reminding ourselves it's just simply pain without attaching to it. No problem would arise for us if we were able to do this. The problem is that once we, uh, if we're unable to understand reality in this way, we're going to give rise to craving. Because of the ignorance that, that exists in our minds, our inability to see these things as they are and to see them simply uh, as arising and ceasing reality, then we're going to give rise to, to craving. We will have this intention arise. When we see something, we'll, think, we'll conceive of it as good or we'll conceive of it as bad. Um, we, we will have some kind of desire, some kind of intention arise. When we uh, hear sounds, we will recognize it as uh, uh, a pleasant sound or an unpleasant sound. Some, a person that we like, if, if it's a music, we will enjoy it and so on will give rise to some intention in regards to it. This is how all of addiction works. If for people who, have, who suffer from addiction to substances or addiction to um, any kind of stimulus, you'll find that, that the mind goes back and forth between these, these uh, different parts of reality, the, 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 the cause and effect. So sometimes you'll, you'll be aware of the seeing, sometimes you'll be aware of the, the craving, you'll be, sometimes you'll be aware of, of the, the mind, the knowing of it and the experience of it. 
when you practice meditation, you'll be able to break this into pieces. The, the mind goes through these uh, again and again and again, and it creates more and more craving. When you're able to understand them, you're able to break them up. When you see something, it's simply seeing. It's neither good nor bad, because there's nothing intrinsically good or bad about seeing after all. It's simply because of our misunderstanding, our ignorance, and because of our past um, habits, our, our habitual ways of, of experience, th experiencing things, remembering that certain sights are going to be a cause for pleasure, remembering that certain sounds are a cause for pleasure and so on, and remembering that certain sights and sounds and experiences are a cause for displeasure, will give rise to our craving, our wanting to develop, to cultivate, to increase, to attain, to obtain the phenomenon and more of the phenomenon, and our aversion, our, our desire to, to be free, to uh, remove, to destroy, uh, to banish the, the phenomenon in the case of those things that habitually we remember as, as bringing, uh, bringing suffering, bringing displeasure, or bring, bringing pain. Because of our, our uh, conception, you know, conceiving things as more than simply what they are, for instance, when we hear someone's voice, right away we're going to put a value judgment on it. Whether they're a good person or a bad person, we like them or we don't like them, a friend or an enemy. When we see someone, we're right away going to get angry and upset because we don't like them or we're going to become attracted and pleased because we do like them, maybe they're beautiful or so on. We're going to give rise to these um, cravings. And this is what's going to get us into trouble because this is how addiction works. If addiction didn't cause trouble, people wouldn't have to look for a way out of it. But, uh, but the truth of reality is that our cravings lead us to um, a cycle of addiction that is very difficult and more and more difficult the longer it lasts to break free from. So this is the next link, that craving. Uh, craving wouldn't be a problem if it didn't lead to the next cycle, and that is addiction. Most people who haven't studied the Buddha's teaching, whether they be Buddhists or non-Buddhists, don't see the danger inherent in craving, don't see the inherent danger in liking. We think that our likes and dislikes are what make us who we are. And this is exactly the problem. Because we have some conception of self, of I, of what I like and dislike, we, 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 don't, we, we stumble right, right over this, this, this egregious error of judgment, that actually there is no I, that we're creating this as we go along. We'll say this, it's, it's our way of justifying liking and disliking. We say, I like this, I like that, and we say this as a justification. It's the, um, the connection, if you will, between our craving and, and our addiction. When, at the time when, when we, uh, we crave something, we think, yes, I, that's, that's something I like, you know, this is uh, my preference, then we'll, we'll give rise to this habitual addiction where we cling to the object, we're unable to let go of it, we're unable to be without it, to the extent where we'll actually cause great suffering for ourselves if we don't get it. And this is the, this is the, the danger inherent in, in, in simple liking, because we are not static creatures, we are dynamic. And everything we do and think affects who we are, changes who we are. Craving gives rise to clinging. You can't stop it simply by force of will. You can't simply wish for it to stay simply as liking, where liking will not give rise to craving. Liking has as its nature the, the, the uh, propensity to give rise to craving, uh, to clinging. Clinging gives rise to creating or becoming. Well, creating, really, um, creating circumstances wherein we can get what we want, cultivating and developing and building, building up, in many cases, a, a huge ego or um, identification with reality, where we have who I am, my status in life, my, my stable reality, my home, my car, my family, and so on. We build this up based on our cravings, based on our clingings. We will build up our whole reality. Why people, why beings are so diversified, why some people are rich, some people are poor, is totally based on where we have led ourselves from lifetime after lifetime, where we've, we've, uh, we've directed our minds. 
and what we've clung to, what we've associated and identified with. And it's because of this becoming that we that we have have all of our suffering, all of our um, all of our dissatisfaction, because it's this creating, this conceiving, this um, seeking after uh, that gives rise to old age, sickness, and death. That gives rise to this um, form formed existence of being a human, of being an animal, of being uh, any type of of creature. That, that we actually create for ourselves, that gives rise to our sicknesses, gives rise to our pains, gives rise to our conflicts and our sufferings, the war and, and famine and uh, poverty and so on that exists in the world. It's all created simply by our uh, erroneous um, uh, uh, identification and um, the, the idea that somehow we can find true happiness in this way. This is the core of the Buddha's teaching. It's really what the Buddha realized on the, the night that he became enlightened, that reality does work in terms of cause and effect. It wasn't a theoretical realization. He saw reality working. He saw that it's because of our ignorance that we, we give rise to intention, even the intention to help ourselves, to, to do good things for ourselves, to create a life that is supposedly going to make us happy. Even giving rise to this intention is due to ignorance, because if we understood, as I said, reality for what it was, we wouldn't see any need to create anything. We would be content and comfortable and happy with things as they are. We wouldn't give rise to uh, this craving that comes from experience. Our experience of reality would simply be the conscious experience of the physical and mental at the six senses. It would stop at the contact and the sensation. We would feel happy, we would feel pain, um, we would feel calm, but we wouldn't attach to any of these feelings as good or bad. Anything that we saw would simply be what it is. We would see it clearly as it is for what it is and not put any value judgment on it other than what was immediately um, uh, apparent as, as, as being what it was, as being a arise, arisen phenomenon that comes about and, and ceases. We would live our lives in the way that many of us truly think that we're living our lives already. We think that we are uh, here living our lives in a very ordinary way, and we think that we in general experience a great peace and happiness. But as a result of our craving and our clinging, we actually create great suffering, and we're not really living in, in true reality. Our experience of reality is, as they say, tangential. We experience reality for a moment, and then we're off on, an, on a conception, the idea of it being a good or a bad thing that we experience. When we see someone, something, we hear something, smell, taste, immediately it takes us away into our craving, craving leading to clinging, clinging leading to this becoming or creating uh, uh, of some kind of um, intention to, to attain or to, to be free from and so on, which in turn gives rise to conflict and, and, and suffering and not getting what we want and getting what we don't want and being uh, dissatisfied and uh, disappointed. And, and sorrow, lamentation, and despair. All of these things come from our attachments, our judgments, our ideas that things are good and bad. So this is a, an incredibly important teaching, as I said, and, and um, incredibly important for meditators. It's really the core of the meditation practice and the core theory that we should understand when we start to practice meditation, because this is how we're going to um, change our minds during the meditation practice. So. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I hope this has been useful and that those of you who are watching are able to put this into practice. Please don't be satisfied simply by intellectual understanding of the Buddha's teaching. Do take the time and effort to put this into practice. Uh, and I wish for this teaching to be of benefit to all of you and that you are able to, through this teaching and through your practice of the Buddha's teaching, to find true peace, happiness, and freedom from suffering. Thank you and have a good day.